it's our job as parents. You're giving your your heart, yourself, your everything to have them meet their potential, be the be best little person they can be. Coming to MIT, coming to things like AT Hack and seeking out new assistive technologies, it's part of that picture. It's part of moving them forward. It's also, it's exciting. Okay, good luck with everything. AT Hack is a hackathon where students have the chance to work on a prototype of a technology with a person in the community who needs that technology. I'm really passionate about technology as an engineer also passionate about public service and I wanted there to be a way to bridge the gap between those two things at MIT. That, that would make the most difference daily in my life. We had to pick one thing that we asked AT Hack to, to solve. What would be that one thing that would bubble to the top? Just to know how much flexibility we'd have and um, let me let me as a designer, we try to get into the mind of the person who's using our product. Throughout the whole event and even like the weeks leading up to it, we, me and my team kept thinking, you know, if I was Lily, how would I use this? If I was Lily, where would I put my hand? Where would I put my weight? You know, how would I walk? How would I move? There's two walkers right now. Our team was trying to build a modified walker for Lily that will allow her greater maneuverability so that she can really be a kid. Walk along the grass, be on the beach with her family, Apparently, Lily has fallen a number of times just walking on the sidewalk because it wasn't smooth enough. Uh, a diameter here and a, and a cylinder here. So she was a, is already taken care of in the design? Like, she wasn't as shy as I expected. She was, she was fearless. Well, is this your first hackathon? You can use exactly. this one. Exactly. Yeah, you yeah, can yeah. Use that'd be totally great. Yeah. Each one, depending on like where you're going. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. like almost makes you like want to tear up when you saw all Lily with her new walker and the wheels. And, like, she was so excited she can move around. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thanks for your help, Lily. Like, one thing I think about when I when we decided yeah. to do this, I do strongly believe in an awareness. A disability didn't touch my world before I had my kids. I didn't know what I didn't know. This opened my eyes a little bit to the way we design things and make things. People well, don't always consider someone who might have more difficulty performing a certain task. I think I have a greater awareness now. No matter what career path you choose, disability is going to touch that. And, and, and having that individual be aware of that, I obviously see the importance.
All right, welcome everyone to the MIT Beer Works Create Challenge. My name is Jose Asu. I'm going to be your challenge coordinator. And on behalf of everyone at Beaver Works, I'm so excited to have you all here. Uh, if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to ask in the Q&A. We're going to have a Q&A session at the very end where we'll first go through, uh, just try to get to everyone's questions. But if you have anything you have uh, to ask throughout the presentation, please feel free to uh, ask in the Q&A. All right, so what is the Create Challenge? What are we all here for? Uh, the Create Challenge is really about three things. It's about STEM education, it's about accessibility awareness, and it's about inclusive design. We wanna push the things that we have developed at the Beaverworks Summer Institute out into the world to bring these ideas of design, engineering, making, and working with others out into your neighborhoods and your schools and your communities. Now. Uh, one thing that I'll point out that we are not actually about is we're not actually specifically about products that work um, because this is first and foremost a learning experience and the people that the students will be working with are helping in this process. So it is not a requirement in the Create Challenge to make a working thing. It is not a requirement in the challenge to scale up your product. It is not a requirement in the challenge to you know, make sure that there are 10,000 prototypes until you have the thing that actually solves every problem in the world. Right, you don't have to solve everything. The idea here is to learn about assistive technology. If a lot of you will probably be able to make things that actually do work, but that's actually a bonus along the way. So uh, there's a question of who's participating in the challenge. Uh, this year, this is our very first year doing this challenge, and we have 46 supported teams and seven open competition teams. You all come from 14 states and seven countries, 34 different schools and organizations. So very, very exciting. And uh, this is a new model for assistive tech education. This model is distributed, it is virtual, and it's in person, and it's community-based. So it's kind of an experiment for us. Um, I'm gonna be emphasizing during the course of uh, both this presentation and throughout the course of this challenge that uh, we're still a little bit rough around the edges. Uh, we're still transitioning to a new format. And so please uh, do reach out if anything seems a little bit odd or anything doesn't make sense, we're still working on it but let's talk about how it is that we got here. Uh, so there are different programs that existed in assistive technology at, in the MIT sort of sphere. Uh, there's been this class that's been running for a fairly long time, the principles and practice of assistive technology. Um, there's been AT Hack, uh, which is the hackathon whose uh, video that you saw at the very, very beginning. Uh, Beaverworks Summer Institute kicked off the design of assistive tech class since 2019. And now we have the Beaverworks Create Challenge that we're kicking off right now. Um, one of the really cool things that I like to point out is just the scope of this challenge. So PPAT and AT Hack targeting about 10, 10 to 100 people, you know, five to 10 to maybe 20 uh, different projects. All of those were contained in the Boston area because we only had access to the people around here. Um, we had an in-person version of BWSI Assistive Tech uh, that was 15 participants and about eight projects, also Boston area. Virtually, we realized that we could actually push this out and then have, about, have more people, have individual projects, be, let this be across the United States and have our co-designers be local to the individuals taking the course. And now we're at the Create Challenge where we have over 200 participants, uh, probably about 50 different projects and it's across the world. Um, yet at the same time, your projects are still gonna be local to the teams. Now, I would be a little bit remiss if I actually didn't point out that we actually got our start here uh, because of an organization called D4AT. Uh, I did not start this organization. Uh, basically what happened was after B uh, BWSI Assistive Tech happened virtually, uh, a number of the alums got, uh, got together a few weeks after, uh, I think it was like just a few weeks after, they was like, hey, Hosea, uh, we want to start our own set of clubs. We want to run this throughout our own schools. Um, would you like to help? <laughs> Can we get some help? Um, so they ran their own thing. It was about 50 people, I think. It was about, it was 10 teams across the United States and their co-designers were local to them. That was actually what gave us confidence over at Beaverworks to be like, hey, wait, 
we can do this. Uh, we can actually expand this out a lot further. Um, so honestly, uh, the create challenge is here because of the efforts of D4AT last year showing us that we could actually do this in a virtual setting. And um, like I mentioned before, we are still prototyping. Uh, so not everything is in place yet. Hopefully it will be in place by the time you get to it. We are still figuring out processes. So uh, please bear with us. <laughs> and one other thing I will also point out is that in assistive technology, the breadth of potential projects and technical skills that are needed is daunting. Um, if your team needs help with something, please reach out. If your team finds useful resources that might be able to help others, please tell us and we'll put it out there for everyone. And there'll be a couple different avenues for you to do that um, as we go on. So uh, before I talk a little bit more about the challenge itself, I want to give you a sense of the scope of projects that have been done in the past. Um, so in order to do that, we have on our panel here, uh, three of our alums from our past couple of years who are going to be telling you a little bit about uh, the projects that they were doing, uh, even in a BeaverWorks assistive tech virtual setting. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand over uh, the space to Miriam. Hi everyone, um, I'm very excited to be here today. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about my project that I created while I was a student a uh, part of virtual Beaverworks assistive technology program in 2021. So I'm gonna be a mentor part of this challenge as well. So I'm gonna be getting to work with you. Um, I'm currently a first year physics and computer science student at Florida. So my project is called the garden cart. The central question of this project was, how can we bring mobility to gardens? So every AT project has its start. And mine had a start with a co-designer that I had a very strong connection with that loved gardening. But my co-designer had a challenge, which was that they had a big struggle with mobility in terms of bending down. So together by interviewing and talking to my co-designer, I came up with the question of how can I bring mobility to gardening for my co-designer? So while spending lots of time with my co-designer, because as you will learn, the AT process is all about working with your co-designer, we together developed the product goal to create a product that allows my co-designer to do all their gardening tasks with bending down less. So when, we first, when I first started my project, I went through many design and iterations because there's always, you always have to figure out which materials they want to start with. How do I start with what I have? You know, I don't have, I might not have all the scales. What can I do right away? So I started out with sketches, then cardboard for my garage. And then I started doing some tests with that, figuring out what works, what do I want to include, what needs to be tweaked. And this is a long process working with my co-designer. And pretty much what I, my idea here was, is to create a cart so my co-designer can garden without having to bend over and pick up pots from down below. She has a much higher surface, which you can see here. So then after a lot of time iterating, I came up with my first, you could say working prototype, which I built using the skills that I acquired along the way. Um, which you will probably get to work with your team. So you don't need to know everything now, you'll learn it. So that's what I did here. And then I continued to iterate. So what's probably gonna happen is you will work on it and then you'll realize that after you test your, what you thought was final project, that there'll need to be some additions. So I continued to iterate on my project and it's still a work in progress, but my co-designer really enjoys using this product and she has found that it brings a lot of mobility to her garden. So thank you. And I really look forward to working with my teams. All right, thank you, Miriam. Uh, so we have two other very different kind, different projects that are going on. Uh, Daniel, why don't you tell us a little, about, a little bit about yours? Yes. All right, everyone, my name is Daniel. Um, I was a BWSI alum in 2020. I went back in 2021 to be a TA, and now I'm a college freshman at Johns Hopkins University studying biomedical engineering. Um, I'll be talking about the project that I did over BWSI, and if I have enough time, I'll touch on some other projects that I did. Um, so this is my project. Um, I worked with a student um, without a right hand. He had a partial palm. His name is Ty. And what we were 
we were kind of coming up with different ideas. Miriam talked about working with your co-designer, talking about what your co-designer's needs were. Um, and so him and I got to talking and brainstorming and we found that he'd really want a, uh, like maybe a prosthetic hand to deal with. Now, as a high school student, I didn't necessarily have the skill set to design a prosthetic hand. So something that's really important when you're thinking about your projects is seeing what already exists there on the market or seeing what already exists. Because you don't necessarily need to design everything from scratch. You can take something that already exists and augment it to your co-designer's needs. So that's exactly what we did. We found an open source prosthetic hand called the Enable Phoenix Hand V3. And it was came with its own assembly kit, um, came with its own CAD models that we could 3D print. And so we did that. Now, one thing that's important to consider if you take something from online um, is to see how well adapted it is to your co-designer's needs. And so something that this prosthetic can requires is enough wrist strength and a large enough palm size. So that's something we had to account for. And if it, you know, if Ty didn't have enough wrist strength or um, a large enough palm size, what we needed to do is we needed to find alternatives just in case it didn't work. And so possible alternatives we came up with was a myoelectric band. So that basically um, senses your muscles flexing. And based on that, um, it will control prosthetic can. Um, there's also an elbow actuated one where Ty can only move his elbow and it also opened and closed his hand. So with all that considered, we went to the prototyping stage um, and this was our kind of finalized product. Um, it turns out that after some testing, it worked great. Um, Ty had enough wrist dexterity and a large enough palm size to be able to use the prosthetic. And this is a video of him using it. So the main takeaway that I would say is that see if your product, if your idea, um, if someone else has already worked on it and see if you can modify or change or build on top of it. Um, that external search of what already exists is extremely, extremely important. You don't need to redo everything from scratch. Um, I have a little bit of time to talk about another project that I did. Now this is over the school year, so a longer time frame, similar to what you guys are working on. But this was a little bit different because Maxine here on the right, she already knew what she wanted. She wanted a, an umbrella holder. Um, and so we didn't necessarily have to go through the interviewing stage. We can go straight into the prototyping. Um, so an umbrella holder, like I said before, we said, okay, what already exists out there? Well. An umbrella holder already exists. Um, what do we need to design? We just need to design a mount for it. So we went on to this, so our first iteration, we uh, see, saw if we could attach a mount to the back of Maxine's wheelchair. Um, obviously, as you can see, the, the umbrella covers more of her wheelchair than it does her. So obviously that didn't work out. And so we were thinking, what alternative ways could we go about? Um, so it's easy for Maxine to use, it covers her, and um, if she finds it um, effective. And so after some prototyping and brainstorming, we thought, okay, maybe if not the back of your wheelchair, what about the side? And so that's the next thing we did. Um, we, this is a, this is a uh, picture of her, her um, prototype on, except on the side of her armchair. And so that turned out to work out great. So prototyping, don't be afraid to prototype, prototype lots. Um, test, test lots. You don't need a perfect um, prototype your first go around. Um, and here's a video of her um, demoing it. And so um, I guess the two main takeaways I would say is that communicate with your co-designer, see what their needs are. Um, if it already exists and if it doesn't, um, you can go ahead and prototype, but if it does, um, build on top of what already exists and add on to it. So, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Daniel. Um, our last alum to give us a little bit of insight into what he's doing um, is Anshul. Yeah, thanks, Hosea. So I hope you guys are all doing well. I'm Anshul, and I'm currently a high school senior from the Bay Area. So before getting involved in Hosea's amazing AT program at BeaverWorks, I was really drawn to the whole idea of using software and other tools to help with accessibility. You know, I focus a lot on this concept of neurodiversity or the concept that people have different cognitive abilities and it's a, it's a whole range. And I was really drawn to using the tools in both the software and hardware world that I knew of 
to create things that can help out. Um, I always love engineering, but having an application for it just beyond making things is the best part. And so I came across AT and I really felt it broadened my perspective on the significance of working with a co-designer, really zeroing in on creating alongside a person that uses the things you make. The core of the challenge, as Jose, I'm sure we'll talk about, it was seriously amazing being immersed in a community despite it being, you know, all over Zoom. And I really developed a formal understanding of this process from interviews to product requirements to actually, you know, building things and iterating it. Um, all while making some amazing friends that I still talk to a lot today and work with on projects together. In fact, in the last two minutes of my talk, I'd like to share a brief synopsis of what I worked on on my project called Shirt Vision, which uses um, machine learning to help my co-designer with Down syndrome. So let me just share my screen. So I made this project called Shirt Vision that seeks to help my co-designer um, who has Down syndrome and lives in a care facility. Um, he has a cognitive ability of about a first grade education. And I've, had, I've been helping him out for about two years, working with him and his mom as I tutor him every single week and really spent a, long, a lot of time getting to know him. In the process, um, as I interviewed him and his mom during the program, we got to learn how his day-to-day -day life works, you know, um, given that, um, his disability impairs him from really navigating through various things. He has a very set in stone schedule for every single day that really lacks deviation and does a lot of things through his computer and, right, uh, and likes to stay healthy and active. But one thing I noticed was um, there was a problem in his schedule and that was that there was one activity that he had that had a lot of overstimulating sources that came to him and that was choosing clothes to wear. That's because when you open a closet, you have this whole array of things to wear, which really um, bothered him at times and hindered his ability to find the proper clothing to wear. With that in mind, I developed a software application called Shirt Vision, which seeks to assist my co-designer with Down syndrome in selecting the correct clothes to wear through visual cues. So throughout the program, I, I ideated alongside um, the amazing staff at BeerWorks and with my co-designer in developing a low fidelity wireframe, making that into, you know, a really, you know, design on Figma software to design a product that seems like it can work and then developing that into an actual product to use. So here's a quick demo. From my user side, he can view an inventory of all the clothes he has, and then he can select based on if he has to go to school or stay at home, what clothes he has to wear. And over time, you know, his inventory decreases until he washes his clothes every Saturday, I believe. And it really helps him with finding the correct clothes to wear in his closet, which really helped him a lot. And so it was a pretty big application. So I think that honestly, the best part of this program was learning a lot about the designing process and really using, you know, these software tools that I learned about to build something that helps someone else. So he can scan his clothes with his phone and then it de determines you know, what type of clothing it is, indexes it into a catalog. And then based on that, he can choose some clothes to wear through the application I just showed. So from the back end, if I was to give a quick demo, he could scan, this is uh, him sc scanning his jacket. And based on this, it shows, it processes it on locally on his computer. Um, and as that runs, it determines that there's, you know, a jacket in his inventory and uses some machine learning to do that, which I can talk about later on. And yeah, based on that, he can identify clothes to wear in his closet and help. And this software actually is used in his daily routine now, which helps him a lot. So with that in mind, I think that my experiences coming into AT and coming out of AT has really shaped my perception on using tools to help others and the process behind doing it. You know, every individual is unique and it's important to understand both the engineering aspect and the communication aspect behind making things with others. And yeah, that's it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Anshul. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Daniel. And, all right.
Now, let's uh, dive a little bit deeper into what exactly it is that we're doing in the Create Challenge. So in the Create Challenge, there are a number of different components this year. Uh, they are, there is an online course. Uh, there's in-person activities, uh, activities that we are going to be sending out to the teachers to help reinforce particular ideas and concepts uh, that are going to be useful during this design process. Um, like we offered to our students, uh, both in the in-person and in the virtual settings, uh, there's also going to be project funding for teams that require it. Uh, talk a little bit more in detail about that, uh, how that process looks like later on. There is, of course, technical mentorship. There's a number of mentors that are on the panel right here. There are also other mentors who are not on the panel who are uh, on, on, in the audience and elsewhere uh, who are going to be helping us along. They're, they're composed of people like engineers, designers, and so on and so forth who have been through this process before and know uh, how what it is like to take a product sort of from the very, very beginning uh, to prototype to more and more advanced prototypes until we could do some user testing and you know, get things out in the field. Um, there is also going to be an on, there is also a very strong online community that we're going to have uh, an opportunity for you all to get to know each other, um, as well as offer and receive help from each other. And at the very end, we're going to have a bit of a maker fair. Uh, so one thing I want to emphasize is that this, in the end, is not really a is the create challenge is not really a competition. Uh, I know there's a track called open competition. It's a bit of a misnomer. Um, really, there's no great way to win this contest. There is no contest. You produce a really cool thing that's used by someone that you care about, right? That's really the, the goal of this challenge. And at the end, we really do wanna know, like, you know, what happened during the process? Uh, what were your successes? What were the things that were difficult? Uh, what were the, thing, the things that you learned and what did you produce? So that's what the Maker Fair towards the end of the year is gonna be for. Um, as far as the schedule for Create, uh, so we are currently in early December, and by mid-December, we are going to be having initial mentor check-ins. Uh, the mentors are basically going to act as intermediaries between school teams and the Create Challenge staff kind of um, as a whole, just so we know that your teams are moving along, you're not having any struggles that we could help, we could help out with. Um, in January, uh, all of our classroom modules are going to be released to coaches, um, so coaches pay attention to that. We'll give you further information about that coming up. Um, and January through, oh, sorry, December through January is going to be an initial peer review period. We're going to be releasing information about how peer review processes work. Uh, but this is an opportunity for you to get to know each other, get to know the projects that other teams are going to be doing, as well as give each other feedback on things that you could be doing better, uh, any suggestions that you might have regarding uh, things that you're struggling with, or better ways to work with your co-designers and so on and so forth. Um, there's going to be periods of mentor reviews uh, where we'll be receiving uh, information from you about you know, what, ex uh, what your challenges are, what your process is like. Um, and at that point, it's just gonna be low fidelity. If, if it's hardware, it might be made of cardboard or duct tape. If it's software, it might be just uh, a, power, a thing made of PowerPoint or a paper prototype. That's not a big deal, it's perfectly fine. Uh, that is kind of the stage of where we're gonna be looking for at that point. Um, and then later on, we're gonna be doing midterm peer and mentor reviews again. And at that point, we're gonna be expecting things that are a little bit higher fidelity, well, uh, a little bit closer to uh, final prototype for, you know, for this course period. Um, and of course, there's a late April final event. Now, the question of uh, how do I get funding? Um, there are a number of teams here who have requested some amount of funding, or at least indicated to us that they might require some amount of funding. Uh, so Beaverworks will be able to provide up to $125 per project as needed. Uh, now, I should mention, mention that teams looking for funding uh, should first pass the low fidelity prototype mentor reviews. If you decide that, hey, you know, the, the scheduling for that is a little bit too late, we want to press that up a little bit earlier, that's fine. Let us know. We can schedule that earlier. And also, you need to supply us with a bill of materials um, just so we know roughly what it is that you're getting. That seems reasonable. And I don't know, you're not getting like a $125 in bolt. <laughs> um, there are also open questions of like, how do you get help? Well, the first line of help, of course, is you, of course, your team coaches. Uh, every team has to have a coach. A coach can be a coach, can be a coach for more than one team. That is okay. Uh, but of course, we recognize that you know, coaches are going to be sort of the, your first line uh, to help teams. Coaches, um, if there are things that you don't know about, uh, that is also okay. Um, that's sort of what the rest of this help is for. Uh, we have a Discord community. Um, that you're going to be invited to, uh, where you're going to be able to talk to the broader Create community. 
as I mentioned earlier, we have our technical mentors. And of course, um, we're going to have office hours starting at the beginning of the calendar year. Also uh, take this opportunity to point out Shana. Uh, Shana, if you wanna just wave, say hi. <laughs> um, Shana is our course TA um, who is going to be helping arrange a lot of these logistics as well as provide a lot of technical expertise um, as another layer of help for you all. All right, uh, so after this kickoff, what is going to happen? Uh, hopefully after this kickoff, you'll all be very excited and there is an online course. Uh, there is an online course at the same page where you looked at um, the, where you did the, uh, where you did your registration. There are, there is a collection of videos and text and activities that are already up on there uh, for you to take a look at. Like I mentioned, there are some components. Progress, hopefully. Uh, hopefully. Hopefully that will be, uh, that will be uh, by the time you get there, that uh, those, those things will be filled out. Um, you'll also be notified about things like the Discord community. Uh, once we basically have all the student registrations in, then we'll be able to send that out. Uh, we'll have mentor assignments for you. Uh, we'll also have a resource map. We'll actually be asking you to look around your communities to help figure out, okay, what are the things that are around us that might be useful? Things like maker spaces, things like hardware shops, things like people who have expertise on various items and anything that you're willing to put on. Um, we want to have collected in a community map so that, for example, if somebody is uh, half a town over and they want some help with something, uh, they might be able to take advantage of resources that you know about as well. This is something that we implemented last year um, or over the summer and it seemed to work fairly well. And finally, we will, of course, provide for you documentation requirements um, for both the periodic check-ins that we're going to have, as well as for the final event. Now, uh, I mentioned D4AT early on, uh, but D4AT is actually, actually also going to be playing a big role in this uh, Create Challenge. And to talk about, a little bit about this, I'm going to hand it over to Nandana, who's going to describe a little bit about what D4AT is going to be doing for Create this year. Yeah, hi. So as Hosea mentioned earlier, D4AT was kind of the student organization that formed after the summer of 2021 by a few of the alumni from the summer course. Um, we kind of, we all built projects over the summer and decided that we wanted to build more during the school year. So that first year, um, several of our schools were able to build projects kind of independently, and then we were able to share those at the end of the year during our Maker Fair. And um, that process has kind of continued into this year. In light of the Create Challenge, D4AT teams will be participating in the challenge alongside you guys. So we're all going to be making projects um, along fairly the same timeline as the rest of the challenge. Um, in addition, though, we'll be offering a couple resources from our sort of prior experience building projects. There's a website on um, Hosea's slide, which is our sort of website. So um, designforat.org, you're free to come here if you want to look at um, the different projects that we've done in the past, as well as kind of the current schools that are involved. Um, in addition, D4AT will also be um, having our own little sort of Discord server in addition to the one for the main Create Challenge, where we'll be hosting community events to hopefully help everyone get to know each other and um, offering some like d practice design reviews in case there's, you know, you want a more casual environment to get um, project support. So yeah, those will hopefully be sent out later. All right. And finally, um, so this is actually just a short, short introduction. Uh, so of course, our thanks uh, go to a number of our sponsors. Uh, uh, of course, MIT of Lincoln Laboratory for sponsoring the, the uh, Beaver, Beaverworks as a whole, MIT School of Engineering, uh, the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, and DOD STEM, and of course, D4AT as our partner for this particular challenge. Uh, so um, I see that there are a number of people who have posted a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, I hopefully I've answered a few of them, but this is the end of the, our formal informational pr uh, presentation. Uh, actually, that's exactly the amount of time that I expected. <laughs> um, and if you have any further questions, we are gonna hang out in the Q, uh, I'm just gonna actually open up the Q and A, and then I'm just gonna look through it and then try to answer as we go along. Uh, is it going to start soon? We're done. <laughs> um, um, if you do not have a co-designer, will we be assigned one? You will not be assigned a co-designer. Um, I don't know who this is. This is an anonymous attendee. However, um, so one, we strongly recommend you find your own co-designer. Um, two, we have recommendations for you for how you can go about finding a co-designer um, on the course website, actually. And three, if you go through all that and you really, really cannot find a co-designer, uh, please reach out and we will help 
do you find one? But we will not assign you a code assignment. Um, the final event will be online. Uh, da, 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 da. What is a when is a good time to visit Beaver Lab to look at projects? The projects do not exist at Beaverworks. They have been all they have all been delivered to their code <laughs> to co-designers. Um, if you want to come to Beaverworks, um, that's a question for perhaps Joel Grimm. However, you won't be able to see the AT projects there. <laughs> How do you find a co-designer? Answers on the answers on the course. Can a co-designer be a pet? Um, I would, I, I think the preference would be no, um, I, I, <laughs> because it is a very different experience working with an animal than working with a human. Um, if you, if you end up having to do that, that is okay. But we, um, for the purposes of this challenge, I think the preference is to try to work with a human. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to hang around a little bit longer if anybody has any further questions. Uh, but we pasted, uh, I, put, I put up the create challenge link in the Q&A. Um, if you want to go ahead and take a look at the coursework now, see what's ahead of you, uh, take a look at the schedule to make sure that you have, you know, things roughly aligned. Um, thank you very, very much for attending our kickoff. We hope that you are exci as excited as we are about this challenge. And we hope that, you know, we get to create awesome things with you. Uh, throughout the course of the next few months and bring these things to people who could use them in their day-to-day -day lives. All right. Well, thank you all for visit, for coming. Um, let's see, we can quickly just answer a couple more questions or people. Uh, da, 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 um, how long is the course? Um, I don't know. It depends on how long. <laughs> it, dep it depends on the pace at which you go through it. <laughs> I don't have a great answer for that one. Um, will you get to work on your project in the Beaverworks lab and use the in-person resources? Um, I do not know the answer to that. That was not something that we had specifically planned. If there is a specific resource that you need, um, you should reach out and we'll see what we can do to provide it. But I don't think that that is something that we're going to try to provide in general, just because the like the teams in this challenge are literally spread across the entire world. Uh, Beaverworks has two spaces in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> um, what exactly are teams expected to show at the final event? Uh, so you're going to be showing a presentation of your co-design process, uh, what it is that the challenge that you're trying to tackle, and the product that you designed at the end, along with some testing results and some reflections. Uh, we're going to be posting specific requirements for uh, check-in periods as well as the final event uh, as we go along. So that's going to be on the website. Uh, are we excited to create some sort of hardware or is software also okay? Well, uh, anything is okay. Hardware and software is fine. Uh, as you saw, Anshul's whole project was in software. Um, so things like that, perfectly fine, not a problem. How can you access the online course? Um, it's, on the, uh, it's on the Create website. Somebody can drop that in the chat somewhere. <laughs> Is the final event a research conference? This is not a research endeavor. Um, so I should emphasize that. This is not a research endeavor. If this was a research endeavor, uh, so as a person who does human experiments, if this was a research endeavor, this would be far more complicated. I don't think we want to go there. Um, however, um, the final the final event current, uh, in our heads right now is going to be uh, a virtual event that might be some that might be similar to some of these virtual conferences that uh, some people in the audience might have encountered before. Uh, we're gonna be looking at something maybe sort of Gather Town-like, uh, but that's still to be, to be, to be determined. Um, do you have any sample preliminary needs assessment questionnaires that you can help with? Yes, this is in the course. Can there be multiple co-designers? Uh, so we prefer that each team primarily be working with one co-designer. If you are working with one particular, uh, if you have multiple teams, it is okay to be working with different co-designers or in fact, the same co-designer. What we want to avoid is for teams to be designing things for what I think of as sort of like classes of people. And we mentioned this in the frequently asked questions as well on the course site. Um, we want you to design for, say, for example, 
Tom who has mobility difficulties and you know is a specific person, or you know Tom and Jane who are specific people, rather than uh, I'm building a piece of software for everyone who you know has difficulty uh, recognizing different kinds of foods, because at that point you lose the connection to specific users. And we don't want you to do that. We also don't want you to be like, oh, I'm designing a thing to like generally help people get upstairs. So again, uh, you lose the specific connection to the code designer. Uh, we want people to be focusing in on specific individuals um, whenever possible. Uh, are the courses completed for certificates? Uh, so this is an interesting question. We thought about how to deal with this uh, because we wanted to make the courses as open as possible. Um, course completion doesn't actually get you a certificate. What gets you a certificate is participation in the final event. So in theory, you go through the course, you complete the final event, and then you'll get your certificate out the other end. It'll say MIT Beaver works on it, it'll answer you know, all those fun things, uh, but we don't plan to be carefully tracking your course completion. And, and, how do we add additional mentors? Uh, so mentors will be, so there are coaches and there are mentors. Uh, coaches are on the school side and you can add those whenever you want. Um, it's not, you don't really even necessarily have to tell us until the very end, <laughs> it's not a big deal. As long as they're allowed to work with the students, this is perfectly fine. Mentors, technical mentors are folks uh, that we're gonna be handling on the, uh, on the sort of organizational end on, on our side, so we'll be dealing with that. You don't have to worry about that. Um, and we'll be assigning mentors to people to just make sure that you're kind of moving along. Uh, can the co-designer be a member of the team? Um, this is a slightly tricky question. <laughs> um, I, I think this is okay. Um, one, but I think one thing to just sort of be careful about is uh, we don't want to have people like a single person or like two people just designing for themselves, right? Because we there being a little bit of a distance between uh, design and use can be helpful to just sort of exercise the skills of interviewing, exercise the skills of empathy, exercise the skills of working with people who are not like, you know, yourself. <laughs> but, you know, we understand that there are some cases um, where it makes a lot of sense for a co-designer to be a member of the team and like that's perfectly fine. Realistically, like co-designers are part of your team, right? Because you're gonna be working very closely with them anyway. Um, any chance of consideration giving out several prizes based on the final products, uh, best, best design, best idea, so on and so forth. Um, yes, there are going to be prizes at the end. They will be category rather than numerical. Um, that's about as much as I can say <laughs> about that for now. But yes, there will be some prizes. Um, there will be a bit of judging, but I should emphasize again that oh, on the whole, this is not a, not particularly a competitive arena. <laughs> anybody else have, anybody else on the panel have any other comments about any of these items? <laughs> I will say, in my experience with designing assistive technology, um, some of the most re rewarding parts is the friendships and the relationships you make with your co-designer. Um, so like half of it is like technology, building this really cool thing, but um, making that friendship is equally as rewarding, if not more so. So definitely, um, you know, have fun with this. Um, don't stress, you have a lot of support here. And yeah. Yeah, um, I guess I'd like to say on the question of like, can the co-designer be a member of the team? Um, I myself being a mechanical engineering student with a disability, I do find myself in a position where I am often designing for myself. But in this particular challenge, I think we want the co-designer to have like this continuous input and like with like, you know, a little bit of engineering knowledge, being able to suggest like some routes that you're going through, but not necessarily um, having all of the onus um, like as a fully participating member of the team. Um, yeah, also because I didn't get a full introduction before. Hi, I'm Shana. I am currently a senior at MIT in mechanical engineering. Um, I am also what's known as a COVID long hauler. So I've 
gotten COVID several times, which has led to nerve damage on my right side, among um, a lot of other uh, not so great symptoms. So I do consider myself a disabled engineering student, which makes me particularly passionate about assistive technology. Um, I also do a lot of electrical engineering work, so I'm able to answer questions throughout like mechanical design, electri electrical design, a little bit of programming, um, and I'm here to be a resource for the, ch for the challenge. As well as help with all the little administrative things. I'll be approving all the Discord registrations so we can get everybody confirmed and going, yeah. Yeah, no, we, we, we're extremely fortunate to find a person like Shana who has a wealth of expertise that is uh, both technical and personal for, for lots of these things that we're going to care a lot about for, during the course of this challenge. Uh, what are the criteria for a co-designer? That's a great question. We have an entire module on that. Go check out the course. How can we contact the mentors? Um, so you'll be assigned a specific mentor who's going to be keeping track of your team in particular. However, you'll be able to contact any and all of the mentors through the Discord um, that Shana has set up, and we'll be giving you access to um, as soon as we can get as soon as we gather everyone's information. Uh, I've been seeing people responding to our form stack thing up until like five minutes ago um, <laughs> throughout all of the last few days. So we're going to be doing that in a few days. You share the email of the administrative contact. Uh, so that would be, let me just type that out. Uh, BWSI create challenge at mit.edu. Great. Um, anybody, if you have any, if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out uh, at BWSI um, create challenge at mit.edu. Um, there's also, of course, the challenge site, which has a frequently asked questions page that is fairly extensive. Uh, I would maybe recommend checking that first, th that first, and maybe poking, uh, poking just through the course material because I think a lot of the questions are actually answered by some of our course content. Um, and then, of course, please feel free to reach out, and we'll find, we'll send, be sending you more and more ways to get in touch with us as we go along. Uh, thank you once again for participating in the challenge. This will be an exciting time. Thank you very much for attending our kickoff, and I hope that uh, wish you the best of luck. And I hope that you have a lot of fun during this create challenge. All right. Thank you, everyone.